Morning, everyone. How you doing? I'm doing great, even though my favorite college football team got second place. But we'll deal with it. Life will go. Life is more important than that. <laughs> we'll come back and get them next year. Anyway, I'm going to preach from one verse today. We've been in Acts 1. We're going to stay in Acts 1 for a while. Another PW, as I call it. The promised weight. And it comes from, we'll be mostly in John 14, 15, 16, talking about the Holy Spirit, but let's begin with Acts 1, 8. But you will receive, this is in red, Jesus is talking to, to the disciples during his 40 days after he's risen. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Again, let's set the scene where they're at. Jesus has risen. Pentecost Sunday has not come. Disciples didn't know it would be 10 days. It would be a 10-day wait. Would they have waited two weeks, three? I believe they would have waited that. They would have went back to Jerusalem and prayed and prayed. And we were talking last week about the 120 of them being in the upper room praying. Mary was praying. I've been preaching a lot, and I hope that a lot of what's coming is the need for continued prayer in this church. Always pray privately. You know, let me share a private prayer I have for everybody. And it would be this, that from now till the rest of your days, or to rest of my, that you would truly be secure in the love of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That you would have your own prayer time, be it five, ten minutes that you would continue to come back to the four walls and ceiling of your church. We love you online. We'd like to see you here, okay? Especially our members to come back. That you use your gifts and you somehow get involved in a little of the ministry and the outreach here. That's a lot to ask from you, but it's kind of an overall plan and prayer that I have for you. You know, a lot of what I say there is not happening in the typical Christian's life. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about a word that's been in a lot of people's hearts the last couple, and it's called fear. You know, we're going to talk about, above, above, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, though. You see, we have something that the those apostles and the ch disciples didn't have that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Pentecost Sunday comes. The Holy Spirit comes. But let's remember, were, were those apostles, were those disciples, I want to be careful, I said, were they saved? Did they believe in Jesus Christ as Lord? Yes. The church had not come yet. It would come Pentecost Sunday. The Holy Spirit would come. The way the Holy Spirit would work, it would change. We talked about that in our Sunday school today. You got to remember, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Saturday, Everything began to open up like a beautiful flower. Did they understand? You know, where are you going, Jesus? Show us the Father. They didn't understand that. I wouldn't have. A lot of us are still challenged by that. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I prove that? It's a, st it's a faith thing. If I could prove it, I, didn't, I wouldn't have to have faith. I know that 2 plus 2 is 4. I don't have to have faith on that. But God wants us to have faith in the Trinity. So I understand these Jewish people suddenly, what's going on? Everything's opening and that's what was happening during those few days, during those 40 days. Jesus tells them to go back to the upper and pray and pray. I don't think his words have changed for the church today, but the Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is in your and again, I, I think I ask, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit lives in you. And because of the Holy Spirit living in you, the Father lives in you and Jesus lives in you. I can't prove that to you, but I know that's true in my life. No one can ever talk that away from me. Do I understand it? No, I don't understand it. The Father, Son, you know, how do you go to a three-year-old and say, three people live inside me? The Father said, you can't do it. But... You know, what? and as time goes and your faith grows, you understand that. There's a lot of Christians who refuse to accept that. Accept it. 
We don't have one third. You know, let's take God. We'll cut him in three sections. You know, I'm being funny here. And we'll take the third part and we'll give him to you. One third of God doesn't live in you. All of God lives in you. I believe that totally to my last breath. Do you believe that? And if God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit does live in you, how are we living our lives? You know, I'm going to say a few things today that may challenge you, but you know, those of you who've known me know my feeling about fear with all this stuff that's going on. You know that I think we should let God go forward in that. Did you pick up today in the prayer that one of my prayers is for our church members to keep coming back. I'll tell you, folks, not because I, I don't want, I don't count, I really, I never count how many people here. Some of you do that in God. I don't do that. I don't get lost in the numbers. I don't go to Brett and say, what was the budget? What was the donor? I don't get involved in that. I let God do all that work. But do I believe, do I have a passion for the church members to continue to come back? Yes. Why? Because I want to say, yes, we have more people. It's got nothing to do with the pastor. I want a lot of you back to be with me. I want to be with you as we go through this season and into spring and into the things that God wants to do through the Holy Spirit. And yet it's sad. Millions and millions of Christians in America, and I'm just going to stay with America today, are scared to death. And they're fearful. And yet I'm preaching on the Holy Spirit who gave us that spirit to take on that fear, to overcome it, to have that love, to have that self-discipline. Again, for those of you who haven't been here a while, I've always advocated, be safe, please. Be safe. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you're not feeling well, you know, God loves some of you who have taught me a lot the last couple months. You stayed home when you weren't feeling well. Thank you. And you got well and you came back. Now, I know there's some people in some churches, they don't get well and they go home. You wouldn't want a couple people to be safe, whatever, but I'd rather see you here. You want to social distance and move six feet apart? Do that. But so many people are full of, I'm just going to turn away from the church. Wow. And I'm all for online. I love, but if you're not well today, stay home. If you're traveling, check us out online. If you're feeling a little sick, stay home. But you know what I'm talking about. Millions and millions of good Christian people have started to just stay home. And don't give me that. Yeah, yeah, Pastor, but I am watching David Jeremiah and Charles Stanley and you too. And I'm thinking, like, that's probably more than I would do. I'm glad. But they would say, get back into your church. I'm glad those of you were here. If it's a blizzard outside and it's 40 below, you know what to do. I wouldn't want anybody to injure that. You know, the fact that I live 100 feet across, I'll always be here. We won't close the doors of this church. But see, we have something that they didn't have yet. We have the Holy Spirit. We have all of God in us. And yet so many people put a lamp on that and... Oh my goodness, I'm so fearful and blah, 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 blah. And I'm watching all the news and, and they need to continue to get back in the word of God. The, the only difference is they were waiting, the promised wait, wait, wait in Jerusalem until they didn't know what, do you think they really thought, here's what we know is coming. There's no way they could have predicted that. If you're sitting there right now and say, Lord, where is my life going to be a year from now? I don't think you can predict that. And I'm glad you can't, because I think it set a barrier. But you can pray about things. We've already got God in us, the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But here's the thing I think it's challenging. We're not waiting. Sometimes you will have to wait on God. How many of you have prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and prayer hasn't been answered yet? Yeah, that's a different kind of wait. But you've got the Spirit in you. I think God is waiting on us today. I truly believe God is waiting. And he'll wait. And he'll wait. He waited 38 years for me. And I'm thinking, are you crazy? Why? But he loved me that much. He waited. 
He's waiting for all those people to come to salvation until he comes again in the clouds. He's waiting. But I don't think we should wait, have him wait anymore. So when people come to me and say, oh, pastor, I'm so fearful of this COVID thing. I'm saying, be smart. I am compassionate towards you. Stay home. Get well. We'll pray for you. But when you're well, come back. We want you back. Today, tomorrow, next, next week. The Holy Spirit... How well do you know the Holy Spirit, personally? I think a lot of churches preach Jesus Christ, and in most of you probably would say, I know Jesus the best. The Father, the Almighty, that's kind of... And He is spiritual. A lot of people struggle with the Holy Spirit that came upon you the moment you gave your life to Christ and will never, ever leave you. But pastor, I've sinned. God has turned away from me. No, you have turned away from God and sinned. And he's saying, come on back. I'll always be with you. God is, all, you know, God watches this pastor when he does some stupid things. And while the Holy Spirit might convict me, his love is still there. I count on that instead of a God like this. And there's a lot of pre I don't. I don't believe that. He's not happy with that. But I've, I've prayed with hundreds of people when I worked at Billy Graham Association. God left me. He did not leave you. You turned away from him. You ran away from him. But he's waiting. Every day he's waiting. Let's look a little at this Holy Spirit. We're in John 14. Let's go to John 14. Now this is Holy Thursday night, Last Supper. Jesus is actually preaching from chapter 13, washing the disciples' feet through 14, 15, 16, 17, Gethsemane prayer. It's a big, it's a big night in, in the Gospel of John. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? Well, I don't, it's, I don't know, it's a big mystery. How well do you know the Holy Spirit? How well do you love the Holy Spirit? You know, the Holy Spirit loves me, and Jesus loves me, and the Father loves me. So I'm a guy that'll say, God loves me, one, but I'm loved by three individuals of God. I can't prove it to you, but I believe that in faith, that all three of them love me. All three of them have agreed on everything together, when they're looking at you and, you and you and you and you and you as a child of God. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't disagree with the Father and the Son. Jesus doesn't disagree with the Father. And they've always been in agreement. Now, why do I say that I'm loved three times? Because I need that. I need that triple love. But yet it is one Lord, one God, one love. But yet in three aspects. That awes me. I hope it awes you too how much he loves us. We're in Acts John 14, 16. In red. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Did you get that? Forever. He won't leave you. So for those who... Jesus left. He doesn't care about me. That's not true. He's never been more closer to you. The advocate. He's a comforter. He's a counselor. Some call him the paraclete. And he's there to convict you in love. Don't go that way. Don't think that thought. We were in our Bible study Thursday night. We were doing Psalm 51. If you don't know that, that's David's great prayer confession that he gave a year later after Bathsheba slash conspiracy slash Uriah's murder. Took him a year to do it. Wow. And it was about God loving him so much that he, 
he, he went back to prayer. The advocate, the comforter, the, the convictor. And we were talking about sometimes the Holy Spirit will convict you that first step. And if you're smart, you'll catch it and you'll stop. If, what was the thing with David's life? He had all, even though God forgave him for all that sin, those consequences he didn't take away. And David's life was forever changed. He went from father of the year to no, you know, his rest of his life was challenged. And the point of the, the point of the message was, if you listen to that conviction and you honor it, You'll be blessed. Quick example, fictional character. You got two men here. One man lusts in his heart and he realizes he shouldn't do that and he goes to prayer and he stops it. That's one. That sin has been forgiven if he goes to prayer and repentance. The second man lusts and continues that chain for one, two, three, four, five years until he realizes everything is a mess. My family, my good life, my career, my ill, my everything is a mess. Does God still love both men? Totally, of course. But the consequences flowed because they didn't listen to the conviction. And you can't say that I don't hear the Holy Spirit. He'll talk to your heart. He's more than a friend. He's the advocate. You know, when you get new life, you know, when you're born again, he comes in you. You know, there's a difference between baptized by the Holy Spirit. That's when you accept. If someone comes down to church today and they go to the cross and they go to their knees and they say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to accept. That Holy Spirit comes upon them and will always be with them. Now, there's something called being filled with the Spirit. That's different. That's where we kind of take our water glass and we let it run a little bit. You know, we get away from the church. We get away from the word. We kind of get in the world too much. And that water glass becomes half full. God still lives in us totally, but we're not filled with the spirit. Why do you think we talk and preach about being revived and being, what is reawakening all about? It's that spirit coming back into your life and you go on, out in the world. Maybe like you were when you first accepted Jesus. You were on fire for God. Has a lot of the church that we've lost that. Or we've misplaced it. For some, we've let this fear of all that's happened take charge. And yet what, what can God do? God still got it all together. We need to, in some ways, have it all together. But we let, we let the fear, and the, we were talking about worry today. Through the fear, all this worry. Now, I always want to say that, you know, David, you're so passionate about living a life for Christ that show a little compassion for those who are sick, and I've lost love. And so that compassion is there. We need to love and pray for people who are sick. And by golly, if this church has taught me in the last, this church has prayed for people. You might do it alone. You might do it in two or three ladies. You might do it as husband or wife. But this church is, a, God has put in my heart, this church needs to continue to stretch its prayer wings and pray. We talked last week that all of us could raise our hands and say, my prayer life's okay, but it could be so much better. Not necessarily quantity during the day, but it could be so much better. And I raised my hand too, as, as we're into the new year. The Holy Spirit, he's, he's so much more than that. Verses 17, I'm still in Acts, I'm still in John chapter 14, verse 17. He's the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you. The spirit of truth. I don't watch a lot of TV. I really don't. Yeah, I watched the football game Monday night where Georgia got luck. No, I'm just, they played great, anyway. I loved at the end of it, I think the coach said, God bless you to the other coach, which was it, under his tutelage. Okay, did you pick up that? He said, God bless you. I caught that. I hope you did. Anyway, I don't. I used to watch Fox more than CNN. 
you know, when Ted Turner made, I, we all watched CNN. Remember we all we all watched CNN one time, long time ago, and that was it? I don't watch a lot of TV anymore. Why? I, I'm not going to be thrown on that side of that. But I got, you got to stay in touch with the world. You need to stay up with what's going on. That truth versus that truth. I'm going to live according to this truth. And you know, folks, when I say that, I'm not trying to be Mr. Pious. Oh, I live by the truth of God. But what do we really live by? What are the directions? What are the directions you use when you're going somewhere? I hope when you walk your walk of life, you would follow these directions. And when you step aside, the Holy Spirit, come on back. You know that Holy Spirit in some ways, and God knows my heart, so I don't want to label him, but that Holy Spirit is like a great traffic controller in the sky. You know when that plane takes off, it's never goes, it gets off course and gets back, you know, gets a little off because of the winds and all that, it gets back on. And basically what happens is the controller gets it lined up and whew, right? And usually for all of us, it has landed properly down the middle because you're all here. That plane does land. But most of the time it's like this. Your life is like that. Through sin and the flesh and up and down. It's But, but it's kind of, you know, to say, it's totally narrow. Yeah, we're going the narrow way, but it gets a little off. Come on back. It gets a little off. Come on. It's like a teeter-totter, isn't it? In your teeter-totter of God, how often is it a perfect balance? Now, if there's a few of you could say, Pastor, it's always on mouth. I want to know you better because I struggle with it. My teeter-totter. You know, David, are you less compassionate for the people who have COVID? Or are you just overly passionate about the Holy Spirit? And i got to learn to balance the two. We want to be loving. We want to be caring. I want you to be safe. But am, am I advocating? Listen to me, to you online. We love you. I'd like you back in the pew. Not for the numbers. I want to be with you. I want to celebrate. I want to sing with more people. I want to pray with more people. Not so, please. Not, it has nothing to do with me patting my side. It's got nothing to do with that. But I think that's what God wants. God wants us to keep coming back. Do you remember when all of this first hit? About, it's almost two years ago, isn't it? When those... But all of this virus stuff hit. I'm preaching at a small little church in North Carolina. Nobody was coming to church. Nobody was going to the bank. Nobody was hardly going to the store. And again, if you're out there listening, and you're 90, and you're home, and your family's doing all your shopping and banking in your home, that's a different example I'm not talking about. But you know, no one went to church, no one went to the bank, no one went to the store, nobody went to Lowe's or Menards or whatever it is, okay? And we all stood that for, what, three, four weeks? Maybe a lot of churches closed. What happened four or five weeks after? Well, I'm going to start going to the bank a little more. You know, like weekly checks, stuff like that. I'm going to Lowe's. You know, Lowe's became the most popular place to go. Masks are... I, I've got a life to live. And I said, what about that first thing that you always did? What about that church thing? Forgot about that. I'm not going to church. And I thought, why? You know, there's a statistic they actually said that 20% of the church members will not come back to church ever again. These are born-again Christians. 20%, you're thinking like, wow. And they also think if, if church members were going twice a month, that's once every week, they went from twice a month to once a month. So basically, you've cut out your church detail at 50%. Wow. And what's the bottom line of that? God still has his church. It's his church. It's not my church. He's got it all together. What's the point of it? Are you going to get the 20% back? And the answer came, no, you're not going to get them back. Wow. Are you going to get those who came twice a month back? Most of them will continue once a month, and they'll sadly fade away. Then what's the answer, David? Are you being... The answer is there's still a 
something out there. There's people around us, 510, there's people in our lives, there's people on this block, there's people within a 25 mile radius that don't know Jesus Christ or that need a good church. And again, if you find a church five minutes or 10 minutes, or love that. I see so many people, I said, are you currently active? Yeah, we go there. And I go, are you happy? Love the path. I go, good for you. We're not just trying to promote Silver Creek Church of God. And you're thinking, wasn't it like that in the first country? Of course. And I've been saying this. Why are we going to spend six or eight or ten weeks in this study? Because what happened 2,000 years ago, the same thing is happening today. There are so many unbelievers out there. There are so many people that work church and they've ran away. And maybe they're looking for a new home. But what's the difference between that and the 2,000 years? We're going to learn that those people believed and trusted in the Holy Spirit. And they let the Holy Spirit move. This isn't about people getting a goal and a plan and just going out knocking on doors. You could do that, you know. You know, let's, um, I think you've done that here, didn't you? Some of you 20 years ago, you got all of everybody together. You all went out and knocked on doors for 20, right, 25 miles. You knocked on doors and you got to let the Holy Spirit guide that. There's many ways to do that. You could do it in the supermarket. You can do it at work. You can reaching out. And again, it's not about numbers. Where are you in the world of fear? What fears you? Let's go back to Joshua 1. You know, I'd like to say Christians never have any fear. That's ridiculous. But let's go back to Joshua chapter 1. He had a fear, but he went to the Lord, and he moved forward in that fear. And he overcame that fear. And he led the two million people into the promised land. I think the Holy Spirit was moving in that. Are we willing to trust the Holy Spirit in our lives now with today, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day, the next day? Knowing that God, the Father, Son, they've got it in their hands. Are we willing to do that? I don't understand God. COVID, you allowed it. You did not cause it. You allowed it. And I'm not trying to be politically safe, like you allowed it. There's reasons for that. But Lord, help us grow through that. And pray, please, pray for those millions. I mean, we only make... There may be 10 here. I don't pray for those loved ones. We're not, here to, we're not here to criticize those who've walked away in fear. We want to pray for them. Pray to the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit will energize them again to come back. To realize, I need the fellowship. This pastor needs your fellowship. Good seeing you, pastor. Nice sermon. You know? Love the lights you still have on your tree out there. Thank you for taking the stable down, okay? The epiphany's gone, you know? Thank you for doing the little display in front. You know, we all need that. You know, let me say, I'm so joyful to see, you know, when Mike and Janet came, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't wrap our arms around you, but it's, it was so glad to see you. And Bill and Sue and Sheila and Steve, and for those who may be home, it's great to see you when you come back. We're not here, we're not here to criticize. I'm not going to do that. But we miss you. God misses you. And I'm saying, I'm not saying you're not going to go to heaven. I'm not saying you're not, but we miss you. The Holy Spirit is in our lives. Again, take that, take that water glass. Where where is he in your life? And if he's only 50%, don't get down on it. That's just where you're at. If that, oh, if that Holy Spirit is overflowing in your life, it's possible. It'll overflow into you and you and you and you and you. I can say right now, the Holy Spirit is overflowing in this man's life right now at this time. But you may not see me on a Wednesday afternoon. You know, no Wednesday night Bible study. There's some things I'm dealing with in my life. I struggle too. I need to get back to the Word. I need to get back and let the Holy Spirit guide me. We have so much. 
You know, we spent a lot of time months ago on revival and reawake, and that is still a key part. As I try to link with other pastors who are truly praying for a reawakening and a revival in Silver Lake and Akron and Rochester and Wabash and, da, 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 and, and, and Indianapolis and out. I didn't mean to change the scripture when I read that today. Let me go back to Acts 1 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'm not plucking in Silver Lake and in, in, into Judea and Samaria because that's. Someone said, well, you're changing the word of God. But to the ends of the earth, that still exists. To the person three miles down the road that God hasn't made a contact with. To a friend of yours who doesn't know Christ. Or a friend of yours that is looking for a good home. To do a little work. To fellowship and be loved. And I hope you'd all say, I truly love the love of this church upon me. Not that you need a hundred people to love you versus 50, but it's a joy. And I've expressed the last five, the joy and the blessing that I have felt from your love and your prayers. You don't come up to me and say, I'm praying all these things, but the prayers, have, the prayers are being said. God is hearing the prayers. As you pray for me, as I pray for you. Let's talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. If we truly let the Holy Spirit work in our lives with the power, impossible things would become possible. Do you truly believe that the Holy Spirit can move through this church and other churches and bring that reawakening in here and let and it, and it can spread? Do you believe that? Whether you're not, you're right. Because what you believe, you believe no, then it's just, you're going to go down that road. I believe it. One person at a time, one marriage at a time, one family at a time, one church at a time. And there are other churches that, you know, I asked the question long ago, every pastor would raise their hand, pastor, we get, let's say we had a thousand pastors from the 100 mile radius. Do you all believe in reawakening? Yes. Do you all believe God could send a revival? Yes. What are you doing about it? You know, I had a situation down in North Carolina where I had pastors that wouldn't even go to their flock and preach that because they were afraid that the flock would kick them out. Just like the, they wanted to do when Jesus came into his hometown. They wanted to kick them out of the synagogue. They didn't want to believe that God can turn things upside down and make it right side up. You know, as we look at where we're at in America today, with all, I, I don't, I can't remember how many millions are there born again Christians today. You know, are they living their lives on the edge and, and it's overflowing, or are they barely getting through? I think it's more of the latter. And we all have our days. That's why we need to pray for each other. But the Holy Spirit lives in us, He's our guide. You know, sometimes they link with GPS and all, but. He's our guide. He'll never steer you. He may lead you through some fires, but he knows that through those fires, you will become better for that. But he'll never lead you to a place and not be with you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a blessing. You know, I'm not going to preach on some other, but I love Romans chapter 8. If, if, if you're out online or here and, you, and you're really struggling with, you know, it's funny, the last year when I was in North Carolina, most, for those of you, I, I worked six years at the Billy Graham Association. I was on the phone every day praying with hundreds of people. And they're like, I'm living, I'm saved, I've, I've, been, I've been saved, and I'm living in the flesh. And I go, well, Romans 8, you actually should be living according to the Spirit. You'll always have the flesh with you, but you should be living according to the Spirit. Great chapter. I'll preach on some other. Romans chapter, it really talks about the power of the Spirit in your life. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a charismatic thing. You know what I mean? I was talking about just because if I started running around the church, it doesn't matter Holy Spirit filled. But I'll share this with you. I walked up and down this aisle early this morning, and I prayed for everybody. 
I didn't know who was going to sit there. I didn't know what guests we had. I, everybody had been prayed for by 7.30, 8 o'clock. And it was just a gentle walk and put my hand over everybody. And I kind of know where most of you sit, okay? But I didn't. And I just said, Lord, pray. bless them. Do you believe that God is great enough and big enough to take that prayer and bless you? I believe that. And I didn't go up and say, Lord, they're really struggling with all this. I just said, Lord, you know them, bless them. And I kind of did it like in 40, a minute. You know, I didn't stay at one section and say, well, she's really struggling. You know, and I don't, that's between you and God. You know, some of you have the kindest heart and you're gentle. And we think that we got to be bold. You know, I might be extrovert and bold, but that's my nature. You might be very passionate in your love of Christ and gentle. That is also, friends, considered charismatic. You know, we get lost in that word. Think it's, it's nothing but craziness and jumping over the pew. And, you know, I've got a thing here. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a dove, even though he... One of these days I am going to follow this thing, okay? Okay. Um, uh, and thank you, God, you did catch me there. Um, he's not a dove, even though he was represented by the dove during John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus. He's not a flame or a tongue, even though the Holy Spirit represented that in on Pentecost Sunday. You know, there was only one Pentecost Sunday. And yet I hear people saying, we want that, you can't have it. You can't have an Acts 2 church again, but you can be Acts 2 church-like. And I think that's one of my prayers, that we will be Acts 2-like. Well, David, why are you spending so much time in Acts 1? Because you can't be in Acts 2 church until you, you were first in Acts 1 church. You think about that. You can't play that role. As we get into Acts 2, we're going to look back at the eight or nine things they did. They were doing this and this and this and this and praying. And today, they went back to the upper room and they prayed and they waited and they waited and they did the work. And when the Holy Spirit came, they were ready. You do the work up front, God is going to continue to add his blessing. You know, a lot of people think that I won't do any of the work. I'll just show up here and let God do all of it. You know, I was praying with a, I was praying with a lady a couple years ago. And the false prophecy gospel has led a lot of people. With, I don't need to do anything. This God can do it all. I'll just pray to that God. So... This lady and I were praying that God would bring a new car into one of our sister's lives. You know, she was at that point, the car was breaking down. And the first lady prayed for him and say, oh, God, bring her a new car. Okay. Well, I had to go get a little lengthy and say, we're praying for that. But Lord, help her to make the right contacts. Help her to make the right calls. Help her to pray. And the first lady stopped me, almost tried to put me in my place. You don't need to do that. God's going to do it all. And I said, wait, 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 wait. God still wants us to do our work. You just don't show up here and says, the house is. How does a Habitat for Humanity house get built? Does God just suddenly go, no, it's blessed by all the work of the people. And God wants each and every one of us to do that work. And he'll add his blessing. I think, I think sometimes in all the work we do, we might do 10%. God do, does 90% of it with all the blessings. Is that true in your life? And there was kind of a back and forth. And I said, you know, this thing that, you know, friends, if you come to church and you give, God's going to just bless you mightily, tenfold. You, you're never going to get a sermon like that from me. Because there's so much false prosperity gospel out there. I believe in the true gospel right here. Bottom line, the lady did make some contact. She did a little of the work. She got the, 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 she got the car of her life. Somebody had given her a used Mercedes, which ran for, what, two, 300000 and she got it for a great bottom line price. God answered prayer, but God just didn't snap his fingers in that. God wants us, why am I saying, God wants us to step out. Lord, I'm stepping out through fear. Yeah. That's what Joshua did. So if you ever get in a point, go back. I love, that's one of those chapters I have to read about. Like Joshua 1. He, here's a man who's done everything in 40 years. Moses is gone. He's scared. 
But God talks to him, be brave and courageous. And he went forward through the flame. And we know the beautiful life of Joshua. It's the same for us. But God, I don't want to go through the flame. Then you're not going to get those benefits. You know, a lot of people, well, God, just take the flame away. The purpose is going through that. If somebody's gone through an illness and recovered, there was a reason for that. I'm not God. I don't know why. There's a, there's a reason for it all. The Holy Spirit testifies about God and wants us to testify. The Holy Spirit brings glory. You know, the Holy Spirit is not about glory for the Holy Spirit. No. That's that third distinct personability of God, which brings glory to the Son and brings glory to the Father as we should do in our walk in other words I don't want anybody to give me any glory I want it to go to the Father I want people to see that God is working through me God is working through God is working through this church rather than oh those people are all awesome and then we get lost in pride and all that the Holy Spirit gives glory But again, Romans 8 is just a powerful chapter on living. And I used to say that. Are you living in the flesh now or are you living in the spirit? Well, you know, I've known Jesus 20 years. And, you know, I've got an addiction. And I'm in a, I'm in a relationship I shouldn't be in. You know, I'm, 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 I'm smoking every day. And I'm drinking and I'm really overweight. But I do love God. And I'm thinking, are you living in the spirit or are you living in the flesh? And you know the answer to that. Now let's come back to the, the caller. Let's come back to the Father. You've got a time of confession and repentance. God loves that. You know, as we said in Psalm 51, God loved it when David, a year later, I'll preach, I think, why did it take David a year to come back to say, well, it took a prophet, first of all, Nathan, the lamb, it's you, bam. Was it because he was king? Was it because he thought he could do anything? Did he kind of bury it and thought, well, whatever, I know God. And it all erupted through, through that year of turmoil and attitudes. If he wasn't the same David who sang praises to God, it all came out. And here's the point. Some of us can be carrying around things in our heart for years. Doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. Doesn't mean you don't have a mansion in heaven. Doesn't mean your name's not in the book of life. But you've been carrying around things for years. You know, as I go through every new year, I kind of go back to that. I don't know if you did. Where am I at, God? I need a couple days alone with you. Is there anybody I haven't? Is there anybody past or present? And I go through that process. And I feel that cleansing out. Rather than, oh, well, I'm going to heaven anyway. It's all forgiven. Yeah, but the consequences are disastrous. Are there little things in our life that we're... Believe me, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. We may just be pushing him away. The Holy Spirit gives new life. Not this life, and it's a new life. I can't explain that. I'm not just sitting up here as a motivational, inspirational speaker. I used to do that years ago. And that was part of my training, which got until I came to know Jesus at age 38. So I, I, so I hope I still motivate. I hope I still inspire. I hope I still enthuse. But it's a totally different life inside I live now. And yes, during the days, I have my up and down moments too. You do too. The apostles did too. I can't tell you where the Holy Spirit wants to take us in the days ahead. I have some thoughts. I have some prayers. I hope you pray for that too in your life. If God should, if God walked in here, Father, Son, and they laid out the plan for the next couple of years, I wouldn't be. I'd be out the door probably. It might be that big. What would have happened if God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit showed up on Pentecost and he said, let me tell you 12, I'm including Matthias, not Judas. Let me tell you 12, let me tell you 100, what's going to happen in the next 30 years of that church. From day one to 30, 
years later. How many of you would have believed what he told you? You wouldn't have believed that. That the world was kind of turned upside down and right side up. From there to Rome, the Holy Spirit moved through the Thomases. You know, I used to call Doubting Thomas, Doubting Thomas. I don't call him that anymore because he got rid of that handle when he learned that I'm not going to stick my hand in Jesus' side. I don't think he did. He had come to know the resurrected Lord. Thomas went out and did awesome things for the glory of God. And all of them did. Yeah, most of them went through martyrdom. But if he had told them that, I truly believe they would have had a Moses experience. Well, I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. That scares me. Those people are never going to come in this church. And you would have all those excuses. So I understand what Moses did when he gave God those five or six things why he can't do it. I think he was human. Do we trust the Holy Spirit to take us where he wants to take us? You know, trust isn't an easy thing. You know, as I think about getting together this Saturday morning, at land, I think it's Land Grill. I always call it Lakes Grill. I don't know why do I apologize. The restaurant down the street there. The men are going to get together this Saturday. We're going to hopefully find, once a month we'll find, second or third week, we'll find the right time to do that. I'm letting God guide that process. You know, other things we plan to do. What are you praying about in your life? Today, tomorrow. Where will we be a year from now when we look back? We probably will do We'll look back a year from now and say, remember where we're at? Yeah, I do remember that. My marriage is better. My health is better. I lost a couple loved ones. I'm preaching the gospel a little bit more. My family is better. Sadly, for a lot of people, it goes, we're not better. Despite the fact that God loves you and has saved you. So let me close with this thought with fear. You know, you can be very passionate about something, but you also have to have compassion. We always want to be a church that's compassionate for those who are struggling. And I'll pray for your family. You know, I could go, I could go up and down the aisles and say, them, and she's not here, and she's not here. And for a lot of you, I'm saying, you'll, get a phone, you'll be getting a phone call from me. You just want to know you're there. We're praying for you. We love you. We miss you. Come on back. You know, we'll keep in touch with you. But we hope you're doing well. We want you to come back. You know, I feel funny. I'm not promoting. I'm not trying to promote anything. From my, I hope you come back. To love God. To praise God. I'll share this and I'll close. I asked last week that God is driving this church to have more of a prayer time. And yeah, I come here from 7.30 to 8.30, and I knew it was going to be a small group, okay? Thank God for the one or two who pop in here, okay? It's always been that way. Believe me, the church, there's never been 40 people flock in, okay? I'm not, there's no guilt there. It's just the way it is. But God said, how do you get a prayer meeting going in this church with all that you got going on? And I went to the Holy Spirit. The old days, David would have listed a plan, and, he would have, and it would have failed. Or it would have succeeded, and I wouldn't have had God with me. How many times have you succeeded in life, and God wasn't with you to enjoy the plan? You wonder if that was really his part. And I miss out on you, God. Well, you did it your own way. How do we do that? We got a Sunday school at 9 o'clock. We're not changing that. I love Sunday school. I love the fact that I don't have to teach it right now. We've got great teachers. Sheila and Mike fills it. We've got great teachers. How do you do that? How do I ask you to come to a prayer meeting? Why do I say that? Because all prayer meetings led by the Holy Spirit lead to something. If you look back over the two, three hundred years, all revivals, all reawakening, all personal leadings has led come from a prayer meeting. And through prayer, this is what God has laid out, and I'll close with a prayer. Starting next week, 
Pray about that. What am I always said for thing? Pray about it. Never say I'm going to do what pastor says. No, no, no. Pray about it. Why? Because I want the confirmation of the Holy Spirit in you and me together. When somebody comes up and says, God spoke to me the same thing, I love that. Because that means God's working together in the unity for one accord. 8.30 next, next Sunday. Right here. It's going to be a little prayer group. And if it's just Pastor David, it's okay. And we're going to pray. And we're going to talk out loud. And somebody said, I don't pray out loud. But believe me, this country needs prayer. Our government needs prayer. Our community needs prayers. People need prayer. You don't have to come and share your personal life if you're afraid. We're not going to God. But we're going to have a little prayer circle right here. 8, 8.30 to 9. And don't worry, Sheila. At 9 o'clock, we're going into Sunday school. I'm not going to go long. I can't come for half an hour. Come for 10 minutes. I hope you'd stay for the Sunday school. We'll have service at 10. And then when service ends at 11, 11-ish, we're going to have another half hour of little prayer. Now, if you've got to go, go. It's okay. You know, if you've got your favorite restaurant, go. I've been there before. You won't hurt my feelings. I don't want anybody here because of guilt. Now you're saying, I can't come in the morning, but I can stay 15, 20 minutes after. That's cool. Pray about it. I like to come in the morning, but I can't stay after 11 o'clock. That's fine. I think the Holy Spirit gave me the option. David, don't ask them to come for another hour. We're not doing it on Monday nights. We're not doing it on Sunday nights. You're all busy. God has said that. You're busy Monday and Tuesday and grandkids and soccer practice. And, do, 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 do. and for me to come and say, do it on Wednesday night. I'm busy. God said, stay on a Sunday, stay with Sunday, stay with Sunday, 8.30 to 9, prayer. It might be, and again, I want to tell this, I want to tell this to everybody. Leonard, if you're back there doing your thing, you do your thing and let us pray up here. If this church gets loud, it gets loud. No one's going to be running them down the aisles, okay? Mike, if you got to come up and practice, and you do what you do for God. Don't feel that you have to give that up. I would think nothing better walking into a church that's alive. And maybe there'll be three of us praying. If you don't want to open your mouth, don't open your mouth. Maybe you just want to pray for this government that's struggling. Maybe your friend. And then we'll do the 9 o'clock Sunday school. We'll do the 10 o'clock service. And afterwards, after we've prayed, we'll have a little private little prayer here, 5, 10, 20. I don't know how long we'll go. That's a pretty good option. And I said, God, that's a pretty good option to lay before the final flock of let play about. Rather than... You've got to come at 5 to 6 p.m. on a Sunday night because this is what Pastor David... It's not about what Pastor David wants. It's what the Holy Spirit has led us to. Yeah, you've got to come a little early, stay a little late. I'll share this quote and I'll close. I've been praying with a local pastor about getting together. And he lives in another city. And he drives 30 miles in here on Sunday. And he's got five people with him. He goes, I can't find a time to pray with you. But then he stopped and said, you know, one day I'm going to stand before my Lord and I can't give him those excuses. Well, I couldn't have come in on a Saturday when I really could have. I could have asked those four people, will you pray 15 minutes with me? I'm afraid to ask them. But when he said, I'm going to stand with a report of that before my Lord one day. Again, we're not here to cast any guilt. I think it's a great idea. Let's start doing that. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, Lord. Thank you for the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you for the counseling that you'll do through this word, Lord. Thank you for the comfort you give us, Lord. Thank you for that conviction, Lord. And as always, as I look up here, as we sing this last song, if anybody needs to come forward, if they want to sit in their pew, there's something on their heart they need to give to you, Lord. Let them ask you, if there's anybody listening online or here that hasn't given their life to Christ, that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit leading us to the Father, leading us to the Son. We've been there. Those of us who've been saved saw that at one time in your life. You were led forward. But Father, we always offer the altar here for them, Lord. Father, bring us back. Help us to really let the Holy Spirit overflow. It might, require, it might require change. It might require a total transformation of one's life, Lord. Father, I ask a blessing for the women that want to start a Psalm 23 study. I love that. For the Bible studies that we got. For the breakfast that we want to start with the men again. For this little prayer time, Lord. 
We're going to turn this over into your hands. Thank you for your lead. Never let it be from men. Never let it be from elders. or the Let it be through the Holy Spirit, through them, Lord. Father, continue to bless us. Help us to pray for those who are in fear today and the millions of, millions of good Christian brothers and sisters who are afraid. And they need to turn that back to you and say, I don't need to be afraid. I need to be careful and safe, but I, I want to come back to church. I want to praise God. I want to sing to God. I want to pray for a few people in my circle, Lord. Father, help us as we just continue to pray to you and praise you a few more minutes here. Help us to continue to be all that you want us to be. And as Jesus told us in the Sunday school, help us to go out and do greater things than you will ever do. It's not because we're better than Jesus. It's because Jesus wants us to do that work as his ambassadors. Help us to be great ambassadors. Now bless us, Lord, as we go out. We pray this in Jesus' name.